Well, good morning, everybody. I am so pleased to be here, especially after the delays that I had in getting here. Makes it all the more precious just for me to be here with you this morning. And I'm really grateful that you've all showed up. I I do feel just a little bit funny, especially about this first session where I'm going to survey the book of Revelation, because you all have been going through this on Sunday morning, and I I wanted to know a little bit what I'm dealing with. So I've been listening to some of the messages from Pastor Neil and Pastor John. You guys are getting a great treatment through the book of Revelation on Sunday mornings. I feel like with this first session, I'm kind of gilding the lily a little bit. But why not do that? Why not talk about the book of Revelation here and sort of get just a big picture understanding of it, especially in our first session? Now, let me just give you a little introduction along these lines. I came to the Lord as a young teenager in the mid 1970s. And for some of you who are younger, that's gonna bring a smile to your face. You think, wow, that's a long time ago. Let me tell you, it was a long time ago. But one thing that was characteristic about the Christian world that I came into, that I was born into in the mid 1970s, is we were excited about the return of Jesus Christ. There was a lot of anticipation, a lot of talk, just a lot of interest in it. And there were some very notable authors, such as a man named Hal Lindsey. Hal Lindsey wrote some huge best-selling books. Matter of fact, I've heard that the book he wrote, The Late Great Planet Earth, I've heard that that was the biggest selling paperback of the 1970s, period. Now, he also wrote another book, which was essentially a commentary on Revelation called There's a New World Coming. You know what they did with that book? They made it into a comic book right there. Now, I was just looking through that in preparation. And what we did was I I scanned all those uh, pages of the comic book. And there's a QR code if you're interested. You could download that. It's great to look at on your tablet. You take a look at that great classic 70s art and such. But when I looked at that, it filled me not only with a sense of nostalgia, but with a sense of, I don't know how to put it exactly, pleasure before the Lord that we are still interested in the return of Jesus Christ. We still understand that the book of Revelation speaks to us today. And so what I wanna do in this first session is just sort of give some overview aspects of the book of Revelation. So especially we understand some of its central message to us. I guess I would begin just at Revelation chapter one, verse one. I think it's always important to remember the context of that very first statement in verse one, the revelation of Jesus Christ. That's really what the book is all about. More than anything, the book of Revelation reveals to us Jesus Christ. Again, I know you've been getting this on Sunday, so I'm just going to speak to you this as a word of reminder, but it speaks to us about the return and the glory of Jesus. Yes, the book of Revelation has stuff to tell us about the person we call the Antichrist. Yes, it has to tell us about what God's going to do in Israel in the very last days. Yes, it tells us about a series of catastrophic judgments that God will pour out upon the earth. Yes, it has to tell us about religious Babylon and commercial Babylon. Yes, it has to tell us about the glories of a new heaven and a new earth. And all that stuff is important and interesting. But if you miss Jesus in the book of Revelation, you miss the whole book. It's the revelation of Jesus Christ. Now, Christians have understood that. They've understood the importance of our recognition that Jesus Christ is coming again. Friends, this is an essential part of Christian doctrine. It's a non-negotiable. Matter of fact, in the Apostles' Creed, that ancient and time-tested statement of faith, which certainly doesn't say everything about the essentials of Christianity, but what it has in there are the essentials of Christianity. There's a line in the Apostles' Creed where it talks about Jesus Christ ascended to heaven from whence he shall come to judge the living and the dead. And Christians have been speaking in the Apostles' Creed and so many other places about the return of Jesus Christ for 2,000 years. And we need to keep talking about it and keep understanding that this is an important part of what we believe. Why? Because Jesus simply said it. He said he's going to return. And the book of Revelation has so much to tell us about the return of Jesus. Now, if I could say, not every Christian has thought so through the centuries. What I mean by that is there's been many different 
interpretive approaches to the book of Revelation. I'm just going to sort of click through four different interpretive approaches to the book of Revelation, just so you can kind of put them in your mind. And it's not so important that you remember the title of these things. It's more important that you remember the idea behind these things. Here's the first interpretive approach to the book of Revelation. They call it the preterist view. And basically, the preterist view says that the book of Revelation deals with the church in John's day. John, the author of the book of Revelation. And it tells us that basically the book of Revelation doesn't predict anything. John just simply described the events of his present day, but it was important to put them in symbolic code so his Roman persecutors wouldn't know what he was talking about. In the preterist view, the book of Revelation was for then. It was John's message to the church in his day. Now, before I talk about the next interpretive approach, I would say we certainly believe that the book of Revelation spoke to Christians back then. There's no doubt about it. There's the first chapter, that beautiful introduction of who Jesus is. There's the letters to the seven churches in chapters two and three. There's the general message of hope and triumph in chapters four on. But I would strongly disagree with the preterist approach in saying that the book of Revelation does not only speak to what the church was going through back then. The second interpretive approach is sometimes called the historicist view. In this perspective, the book of Revelation is a sweeping, disordered panorama of all church history. It's just sort of a grab bag. This thing happens here, this thing happens here, but it doesn't really have any coherence. It predicts the future, but the future of what we would call the church age, not anything specific with end time events. They would say the book of Revelation speaks to now, not necessarily the future, but now. Now, friends, I want you to know, I do believe that the book of Revelation speaks to us now. It it doesn't only speak of what's going to happen in the future, but it describes things that are helpful for us now. But, but it goes far beyond that as well. Then there's a third interpretive approach, the poetic view. It says that the book of Revelation is a book full of pictures and symbols that were just encouraged and comforting to the persecuted Christians in John's day. It's not meant to be literal or historic, neither then nor now. It's just allegorical and rich of personal meaning. This is the kind of approach that takes the book of Revelation just says, what does it mean to you? And if that's the only important thing. Now look, I believe that the book of Revelation is rich with personal meaning. You and I both know that it promises a blessing to those who read it, to those who study it. Yes, God has personal things to speak to us in and through this book, but it's not only that. That's why I think that even though there's some value to the preterist view, there's some value to the historicist view, there's some value to the poetic view, I really think that the best way to understand the book of Revelation is the fourth view, the one that we call the futurist view. In the futurist view, beginning with chapter four, Revelation deals with the very end times, the period directly preceding the return of Jesus. And in the futurist view, Revelation is a book that mainly describes the end times. Now friends, I think that this is plainly obvious by taking a look at the very structure of the book of Revelation. When you take a look at the book of Revelation as a whole, there's a couple things that come to mind, first of all. And this is a very important point to tread. I'm sure it's been mentioned several times, but friends, the most important interpretive key for understanding the book of Revelation is to understand the Old Testament. There is no book in the New Testament with so many quotes and allusions to the Old Testament than the book of Revelation. Matter of fact, by some counts, Revelation contains more than 500 allusions to the Old Testament. And 278 of the 404 verses make some reference to the Old Testament. That's almost 70% of the verses in Revelation make some kind of reference back. Look, the interpretive key to the book of Revelation is not um, Google News. 
though I, I think it's important to understand current events in light of what the Bible says. The interpretive key is not some dusty writing from hundreds of years ago. No, the key to understanding the book of Revelation is a good, healthy understanding of the Old Testament. Now, that being said, the book of Revelation, as you've already discussed here on Sundays, it really does have a interpretive key laid out for us in um, the very first few verses where it speaks about the things which you have seen, the things which are, and the things which will take place after this. That's what God told uh, John to write about in Revelation chapter 1. Matter of fact, I'm looking for that verse right here. Uh, that's in verse 19 of chapter 1. Write the things which you have seen. That contains the content of chapter 1. Write the things which are, that contains the content of chapters two and three, and the things which will take place after this. And friends, that's why I believe so strongly in the futurist perspective, interpretive framework for the book of Revelation. Look, I'm just trying to take the words as they're on the page there. The things which shall take place after this, after these things. Revelation itself is a book that speaks to us about what will happen in the future. And so we can just walk through it sort of step by step. Chapter one is about this glorious vision of Jesus Christ. And you've already looked through that on Sundays. It's an amazing passage of scripture where Jesus appears to John so powerfully, so beautifully in his heavenly glory. Then you have chapters two and three, which describe the things are, which are how Jesus speaks to the churches of his day, at least seven of them in this area of Asia Minor, which we would call modern day Turkey today. By the way, I, I do find it helpful on a personal level to see that there were some real difficulties in the very earliest church. Because you remember that as you walk through those passages, these letters dealing with the seven churches. You know, sometimes we over romanticize the early church. And we think, oh, wow, it was everything so great and awesome. And if we could just get back to the early church times, I read those seven letters to the seven churches of Revelation, and I say, wow, we are an apostolic church in many ways. We carry some of their strengths, but also several of their pitfalls, several of their errors as well. And so we read through those letters. We see what Jesus had to say to those ancient churches, and we read what it says to us today. And if I could add one thing to that, there is a tendency when we walk through those letters to the churches of Revelation, to identify ourselves with one of those seven churches. It's like, here's a great big selector reel. You know, maybe it's a big wheel that you spin around and you just wait to see which one it comes up. Which church are you? And we kind of all intuitively know what kind of church is Coastline? You guys are the church of Philadelphia, of course. You guys are the best church of them all. Yes, yes, that's it. But this is what I just want to remind you of. Even though there is so much about a congregation like this that is true also of the church to Philadelphia, Jesus did not say, he who has an ear, let him hear what the spirit says to the church. If you'll notice, repeatedly he said, he who has an ear, let him hear what the spirit says to the church as. It's in the plural. There's something that we need to learn and gain from what Jesus says to every church. Now, I would just say, please avoid the temptation to say, well, we're obviously the church of Philadelphia. We don't have to think about those other ones. No, you need to hear what the Spirit says to the church as, because there's something for us to learn and be corrected or encouraged or strengthened in from each one of them. But then after Jesus speaks to all these churches that are in the region of Asia Minor, modern day Turkey, 
But by, by the way, if you ever have a chance to take a tour, you know, sometimes they call it a footsteps of Paul or the seven churches. If you have a chance to take a tour like that, it is amazing to take a tour like that. I've taken a couple of them. I, I can't wait to go back some other time. But you, you see something amazing. I, I, I would say this. Make your first priority, if you have the ability, make your first priority to take a trip to Israel. You got to see Israel. If you have the opportunity to do it. But second on your list should be to see that area of modern day Turkey, those churches of the Asia minor area, the, 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 the remains there. It is a amazing experience. Now, after that, beginning at chapter four, you have this remarkable section where, as Jesus outlined in Revelation chapter one, verse 19, he would speak about the things which will come after this, will take place after this. And so in verse chapters four and five, I should say, you'll have um, the, the, the lamb on the throne and this amazing scene of receiving the scroll. But then in verse, in chapters six, seven, and eight, you have the seven seals. In chapters eight through 11, you have the seven trumpets. And then basically in chapters 12 through 18, you have the seven bowls and all that are entailed with that. Now, friends, I I need to just remind you of something that these middle chapters of the book of Revelation speak to us about what God will do in history on this very earth. And Christians have had different understandings about the big picture of what God is going to do in history. Now, I'm going to introduce some other theological terms to hear again. I'm not so hung up on you remembering the exact term, but I think it's important for you to understand the concept. Earlier, I spoke to you about four different interpretive approaches to the book of Revelation. Now I want to speak to you briefly about three different general understandings that Christians have had about the return of Jesus Christ and how it all fits with the establishment of his kingdom on this earth. The, the first one of those is something called amillennialism. Now, amillennialism speaks to the idea that, well, you know what a millennium is. It's a thousand. And that letter A before it means no thousand. That there is no thousand. Basically, the book of Revelation does specifically describe for us in its later chapters, a thousand year reign of Jesus Christ on this earth. And these different interpretive approaches have all centered around these frameworks for how to understand biblical prophecy have all centered around this idea. How do we regard this thousand year reign of Jesus Christ? Is it literal? Is it symbolic? Is it a thousand years? Is it 10,000 years? Is Jesus on the earth? Is Jesus in heaven? How should we regard this thousand years? Now, again, one perspective, and if I could say this has probably been the dominant perspective throughout Christian history. Throughout the 2,000 years of the church, there's probably been more theologians, more Bible commentators that have championed this view than any other. I think they're wrong, but, but I don't mind telling you that this has been a majority opinion throughout the Christian world. All millennialism. And basically it says this, that the rule and reign of Jesus on earth is only a spiritual concept. That when it says in the book of Revelation that he'll reign for a thousand years, that Satan will be bound and put into an inaccessible place for a thousand years and no way, not able to influence what happens on the earth any longer, that that's only a spiritual idea. And... That Jesus is ruling and reigning through his church right now in the present age. In a sense, the all millennialist will say, we are in the millennium right now. From my reading of the Bible, that would be a tremendous disappointment. But that's what they say. It's just a spiritual concept. And Jesus is ruling and reigning through the church right now. And at some point, Undetermined time, because again, if you're a faithful Christian and a millennialist, you do believe in the return of Jesus. This at some 
unspecified time, out of the blue in the future, Jesus is going to return in glory. But he won't return to set up his kingdom because his kingdom is already on the earth right now. That's all millennialism. The second perspective is called post-millennialism. And this is the idea that says, no, Jesus will rule and reign spiritually through his church as the church takes dominion over the institutions of society. And after Jesus takes control of the earth spiritually through his church, then he'll return to the earth to sort of wrap up history. Now, this is the idea, first of all, that this thousand year reign has nothing to do with a number, that the number itself is, is symbolic, but, but Jesus will rule and reign over the earth, over the nations of the earth, over the kingdoms of this earth. He will rule and reign, but he'll do it spiritually through his church. And it's up to the church to take over all the institutions of every nation and then the return will come. Again, that's premillism. And the idea is the millennial kingdom is established by the church. And again, they would insist it's Jesus working through the church, but it's by the church. Then Jesus will return. The millennium happens before the glorious return of Jesus. Now, friends, I got to say, I believe that all millennialism and Pre, uh, post-millennialism, excuse me, post-millennialism are wrong. I believe that the proper perspective is to have, is called pre-millennialism, where we believe that the rule and reign of Jesus on earth will be a literal reality. I don't know how much more plain to say it. I believe that Jesus, the same Jesus who walked this earth, the same Jesus who died on a cross and was resurrected and ascended to heaven. The same Jesus that sits at the right hand of God the Father on high in heaven now. The same Jesus who will return in glory. That Jesus will reign over this earth as King of kings and Lord of lords. I, I don't know why that's such a far out concept because it seems like that's what the Bible pretty much describes. Jesus Christ will reign on this earth and... His people will definitely be involved in that, no doubt about it, but they will be involved as his administration, as his civil servants. In their resurrected bodies, they will assist Jesus in the governance of the world over this amazing period that we call the millennium. And then Jesus will establish this rule and reign himself, not through the church, and Jesus will do this after he returns to the earth in his second coming. In other words, Jesus returns before the millennium. That's why we say this is pre-millennialism. Now friends, if I could just speak with you very frankly here. There are aspects of post-millennialism that make me nervous in the modern world. Because I understand the idea, especially in the chaos of the world that we see around us, to say, wouldn't it be better if the church took over everything? Wouldn't it be better if the church, we see the madness in our culture out there today, don't we? We see the, the sexual confusion, the gender confusion, the, the cultural confusion. We see the madness that seems to be imposed on us all around. And, and it's easy to think, wouldn't it be better if the church ran everything? And friends, I just got to say, I don't know if I trust us to run everything. <laughs> I look back over history and I look at the periods when the church did run everything, or at least ran substantially more than it does now. And sometimes those periods weren't as bad as many people paint them, but they weren't all sweetness and light either. You know who I do trust to set things right? Our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. 
You know who I do trust to absolutely righteously and fairly implement the law of God governing over all the earth in perfect fairness and perfect justice and perfect holiness. I trust Jesus Christ to do that. I don't think I trust any man to do that. Now, please, I hope that nobody misunderstands what I'm saying. I do believe that Jesus gave us a command to occupy as um, to occupy until he comes that we are to be salt, that we are to be light. And we as Christians should look to do as much good in our community, especially in this amazing democracy that we have. We should make our voices heard. We should realize that, that we're invited by our government to make our voices heard and we should do it. We should do it in the smartest and the best ways available to us. But we always understand that even though I think it's great and good and important for Christians to be very politically involved and invested, we never put our hope in politics. Our hope is in Jesus Christ. So that's a line that we have to walk. And in my view, it's another one of the demonstrable weaknesses of that post millennial view. Now, if we come back to understanding that in the whole conduct or the whole carrying out of the book of Revelation, we see that when we get to these great judgments that the book of Revelation announces, the judgments having to do with the seal judgments, the trumpet judgments, the bowl judgments, we see that this describes something that the Bible speaks of as being the great tribulation, the season when God pours out his judgment his wrath upon a God-rejecting world. I do need to speak just a little bit about that whole concept of the judgment of God. It's a concept that makes many of us somewhat uncomfortable. Wow, God is judge. God condemning people. God sentencing people to punishment. God cleansing and purifying society with radical judgments. I understand that that makes us uncomfortable. And I'll tell you one of the reasons it makes me a little bit uncomfortable because I can't help but think, man, what would I do in that situation? But can I just tell you something I am very, very grateful for? I bet you'd be grateful for it too. I'm not the judge. Now, aren't you grateful that I'm not the judge? Because if I were the judge, I don't know what I would do. I don't know how I would do it, but you know it's the one I can trust to be the judge? The God enthroned in heaven. The God who made opportunity through his own nail-scarred hands for every rebel to come back. I trust that God to judge those who insist on carrying on in, his, in their rebellion against him. I do trust that God. There are many people today who seem to deny the fundamental right of God to judge humanity. I see this as a very common theme. I see it in a lot of the writings or a lot of the, the words spoken of by what you might call the new atheists. They are offended at the judgment of God. It's as if they stand back and they say, how dare God do that? How brutal of God to do that? Let me tell you something. The judge of all the earth will do right. And there's something curious that I find out when I, when I look at these people, when I read the writings, when I hear what they say about their offense, about God having the right to judge. They seem to have no problem at all in judging God. But they would deny to God the right to judge his own creation. Friends, I'm here to tell you that whenever you read the admittedly gnarly judgments of the seals, the trumpets, and the bowls. Because if you read them beyond any kind of superficial level, it makes a lump in your throat. 
you realize that God announces that horrific judgments are going to come upon this earth. You always have to come back to this principle. God has the right to judge humanity. And because God has the right to judge humanity and because he's God, he will do it justly. He will do it fairly because the judge of all the earth will do right. If you read Revelation disconnected from that understanding, it sounds like a horror movie, but it's not a horror movie. It's about the judgments of a righteous God. Now, when we're talking about these judgments of the seals, the trumpets and the bowls, let me speak to you just for a few minutes about the possible arrangement of it. I listened to a message that Pastor Neil did on August 7th, a little more than five weeks ago. And he did a great job of talking about that. So I'm just going to run over the same ground because I find it very interesting. In chapter 6 through 18, basically, you have an unfolding nature. And you know this because you've been going through it on Sunday of seal judgments, trumpet judgments, and then bowl judgments. And of course, because we read a book from beginning to end, they kind of seem sequential. Here come the seal judgments. Here come the trumpet judgments. Here come the bowl judgments. And we think, well, that's apparently how they lay out. But I want you to know, it could be a little more complicated than that. I'm going to give you three possible arrangements for those series of judgments. First of all, would be the consecutive arrangement. That is just simply to say that the seals, bowls, and trumpets happen one after another for a total of 21 consecutive acts of judgment. First, you have the seals, then the trumpets, then the bowls. And by the way, might I say that to a Western reader such as us, that's the most natural way to read it. Because, hold with me here, Revelation chapter 15 comes after Revelation chapter 6. That's not big news, right? We just kind of tend to read through it sequentially. Okay, that's the first way to look at it. But I want to suggest a couple other possible arrangements. The second arrangement is the telescopic one. And that is that the seals, bowls, and trumpets are arranged telescopically. The seventh seal contains the seven trumpets, and the seventh trumpet contains the seven bowls. Well, that's a possible way to do it. They sort of trigger one another. And as you read through the text, you can see where somebody would get that perspective. Okay, maybe that's the case. They all sort of encompass one another. But I have to say that if I favor any particular interpretive approach, I, I can't be dogmatic about it. But if I were to favor any particular one, it would be the third arrangement I'll suggest to you. And that's the idea of repeated cycles. That is, the seals, the bowls, and the trumpets represent three repeated cycles of judgment. And it's for a couple of reasons. First of all, to give emphasis, by the way, if I could say, that's a very Hebraic way of telling a story. You can find this back in Genesis chapters 1 and 2, where God tells the story of creation, and then what does he do again? He tells it again and fills in more details. And so now to us in our Western mind, it drives us a little bit crazy because we think very sequentially and chronologically, the mind of the ancient Near East didn't think that so much. They would often tell a story and then tell it again and fill in more details. That's what I think we may very well see here. So it's first of all to give emphasis, but then also I find something fascinating in the book of Revelation. I find that in the account of the seal judgments, of the trumpet judgments, and of the bowl judgments, at the end of each one of these cycles, we seem to come to the brink of the glorious return of Jesus. And then what do we do? We go back to the beginning again and work through a series of judgments. Let let me show you what I mean by that. Revelation chapter 6, verse 15, 16, and 17, the sixth seal, this is the sixth seal, it says this, And the kings of the earth, the great men, the rich men, the commanders, the mighty men, and every slave and every free man hid themselves in the caves and in the rocks of the mountains and said to the mountains and the rocks, fall on us and hide us from the face of him who sits on the throne and from the wrath of the lamb for who is able or for, excuse me, for the great day of his wrath has come and who is able to stand. Can I make two quick observations about those verses? First of all, are you just as struck as I am by that phrase, the wrath of the lamb? I don't know if I've seen many angry lambs in my life. 
if you're going to use the phrase wrath, wouldn't you say the wrath of the lion, the wrath of the bear, something like that? Some fierce creature? Friends, it's amazing to think that the wrath of the lamb tells us that God is justified in his judgment because any judgment that comes, comes from nail pierced hands from the lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. If the world would only receive it. But I want you to notice here in the sixth seal at the end or towards the end of the cycle of the seals, doesn't it look to you in those verses like Jesus is coming back in glory. They're hiding. And then what do you do? It's as if God brings us up to the brink at the end of the seals. And then he says, you know what? Let's crank this thing up again and work through a cycle of trumpets. That's why the seventh trumpet, if you look at Revelation chapter 11, verse 15, it says this. Then the seventh angel sounded and there were loud voices in heaven saying, the kingdoms of this world have become the kingdoms of our Lord and of his Christ and he shall reign forever and ever. That's Revelation chapter 11, verse 15. Doesn't it sound like with the seventh trumpet, you've come to the glorious return of Jesus? But then God brings us to the brink and then he says, you know what? In mercy, I'm going to give human. I'm going to stretch this out as long as possible to give humanity a chance to repent. So let's run through another cycle. And then he runs through the cycle of the seven bowls. And the seventh bowl sounds like this. Revelation chapter 16, verses 17 and 18. Then the seventh angel poured out his bowl into the air. And a loud voice came out of the temple from heaven, from the throne saying, it is done. And there were noises and thunderings and lightnings. And there was a great earthquake and such a mighty and great earthquake as has not occurred since men were on the earth. Well, friends, with the seventh bowl, there is no more delay. Jesus returns in glory after the judgment of Babylon has been revealed in chapter 17 and 18. In chapter 19, we have the glorious return of Jesus Christ. But I see a repetition in the seals, the trumpets, and the bowls as if God was saying, I want to show humanity that I am delaying this as long as I can because I want as many to repent as possible. Which kind of brings us back to the 1970s. Friends, there were people in the 1970s who really, really believed that Jesus was coming soon. Were they fools for believing that? I don't think so. And I don't think anybody should have a sense of resentment of Jesus saying, well, why didn't you return when I wanted you to back then? Believe me, as someone who came to Christ as a young teenager in the mid 1970s, there were many times as a very young Christian, the night before a particularly difficult exam at school that I was praying for the return of Jesus. There's no point in being resentful over that. We see that any perceived delay on our part, it isn't a delay in God's economy at all. But what it is, is it's God being merciful to humanity. Look, uh, I live in California. I don't know if you know, there's a lot of people leaving California. You got some Californians moving out here? Sure you do. And you know the same pattern, California moves and they go to Florida, they go to Georgia, they go to Idaho, they go to Arizona. And their attitude is pretty much this, is as soon as they move to those other places, they do not want a single more Californian to move to their place. (laughs) Get me out and then nobody else. Isn't it strange if we would adopt the same approach to the kingdom of God? Lord, rescue me, (laughs) then roll up. The, the, the red carpet, close the door because I'm in. You know, as soon as we talk about that, we see how funny it is. And we say, Lord, I want you to return. I believe you're going to return. I'm excited about your return, but I'm going to trust your timing in it all. Now, that's going to lead us in very much into our next session. Because in their next session, what we're going to talk about is reasons to believe that Jesus Christ is coming soon. And I want you to understand why I 
can tell you, I think with some confidence, that we should live as people who anticipate the soon coming of Jesus Christ. And that's why I think it's so great that you all are studying the book of Revelation, not only to receive the blessing inherent in the study of the book of Revelation, but also, also, to have that assurance that there's something good that happens in the soul of everybody who makes themselves ready for the return of Jesus. Father, thank you for this first session. We pray, Lord, that you would just pour out upon us a continued stamina for this day, continued understanding to drink in what you have to bring to us. And we say, Lord, would you prepare us a little more through this day for your glorious return. Do it, my Lord, in Jesus' name, amen.